Assalamualaikum and good day. Today we are going to start another chapter and it is on stereochemistry. Okay, what does stereochemistry stands for? Stereochemistry refers to the three-dimensional structure of a molecule. As a consequence of stereochemistry, apparently minor differences in 3D structure can result in vastly different properties. We can observe this by considering starch and cellulose, which are both of the same repeating units. In cellulose, the oxygen atom joins two rings using two equatorial bonds. In starch, the oxygen atom joins two rings using one equatorial and one axial bond. Figure 5.2 shows the three-dimensional structures of cellulose and starch. We can see cellulose consists of an extensive three-dimensional network held together by hydrogen bonds. And starch polymer is composed of chains that wind into a helix. There are two major classes of isomers. Isomers are actually different compounds with the same molecular formula. The two major classes of isomers are constitutional isomers and stereoisomers. Constitutional or structural isomers have different iopac names. They have the same or different functional groups, different uh, physical properties and also different chemical properties. Stereoisomers differ only in the way the atoms are oriented in space. They have identical IUPAC names, except for a prefix like cis or trans. They always have the same functional groups. A particular three-dimensional arrangement is called a configuration. Stereoisomers differs in configurations. As we did, as we saw in chapter four before, you saw the constitution, the co configuration, the different configurations of the chair conformations we, where we have uh, the cyclohexane in the chair conformation. One, we can see uh, having maybe a cis, uh, a, the cis stereoisomer can have two different uh, configurations when the chair flips. Let us now see the difference between constitutional isomers and stereoisomers. You can see in the example given on the left, they are constitutional isomers. They have the same number of carbons and hydrogens, which shows one is 2-methylpentane, the methyl is at the second carbon, and the other shows 3-methylpentane, and the, the methyl group is on the third carbon. Since they have the same molecular formula and, and but different names, we call them constitutional isomers. When we talk about stereoisomers, they will have the same name, but they only differ from the space where the methyl groups occupy. In the first example, we can see cis 1,2-dimethyl cyclopentane. Both the methyl groups are pointing in the same direction, but the trans 1,2-dimethylpentane in the trans 1,2-dimethylpentane, we can see that the methyl groups are pointing away from each other. What are chiral and achiral molecules? First of all, let us uh, look at the example of the left hand and the right hand. So although everything has a mirror image, mirror images may be impossible or they may not be super impossible. Let us look, take your left hand and your right hand. Try to superimpose the left hand on the right hand. You will find that they are non-superimposable. So a molecule or object that is non-superimposable on its mirror image is said to be chiral. Let us look now at another molecule. For instance, we take two socks from a pair they are mirror images that are superimposable. A sock and its mirror image are identical. So a molecule or an object that is superimposable on its mirror image is said to be achiral. A molecule or object 
that is not superimposable on its mirror image is said to be chiral. Okay, in order to determine whether the molecules are chiral or achiral, we can see these are actually mirror images of each other. But then, if we can take this and superimpose, this is a model of the water molecule. If they are superimposable, so they are achiral. And the next one we can see is the chlorobromo molecule. You can see this shows a pair of okay this shows that they are mirror images of each other but then if we were to take this and superimpose on this molecule like this we find that this molecule is superimposable since they are superimposable therefore they are also a chiral let us now look at the molecule label a and its mirror image label B. They are not superimposable. No matter how you rotate A and B, all the atoms never align. Thus, 2-butanol is a chiral molecule. A and B are different compounds. A and B are stereoisomers, specifically they are a pair of enantiomers. A carbon with four different groups on a tetrahedral carbon, one, two, three, four. This carbon atom is known as the stereogenic center. And when we want to draw a 3D dimensional uh, structure on paper, we use for A, as we can see, the hydroxide is pointing in front of me. The hydrogen is going behind, but this, the methyl and the ethyl is in this plane of the paper. They are straight lines. And for the um, enantiomer, the mirror image, we can see the hydrogen is going away. The hydroxide is pointing in front and the methyl is going up and the Ethyl is going, both of them are in the same, in the plane of the paper. So this is a pair of enantiomers and they are uh, stereoisomers which are mirror images of each other. So as a summary, we can see molecules with no stereogenic centers will not be chiral. With one stereogenic center, a molecule will always be chiral. With two or more stereogenic centers, a molecule may be or may not be chiral. So achiral molecules usually contain a plane of symmetry, but chiral molecules do not. A plane of symmetry is a mirror plane that cuts the molecule in half, so that one half of the molecule is a reflection of the other half. Let us consider now this molecule the bromochloromethane. For the chlorobromomethane, if we were to align this in a straight line, we can see that there is a plane of symmetry in over here where the molecule can be uh, cut into two, two parts and we see two equal halves. Okay, and then, but in this other molecule, which is the bromoiodochloromethane, we see there is no plane of symmetry. We can't cut it through here, neither can we cut it through here, or in any way can we cut. So this is a chiral compound. This is an achiral compound. So to summarize the basic principles of chirality, what do we see? First, everything has a mirror image. The fundamental question is whether the molecule and its mirror image are superimposable. If a molecule and its mirror image are not superimposable, the molecule and its mirror image are chiral. The terms sterogenic center and chiral molecule are related but distinct. In general, a chiral molecule must have one or more sterogenic centers. 
the presence of a plane of symmetry makes the molecule a chiral as we saw in the previous video slide so let's see what are sterogenic centers and how do we lo locate a sterogenic center so first of all we examine each tetrahedral carbon atom in a molecule and look at all the four groups that are attached to to it or bonded to it okay we see always we omit from consideration all carbon atoms that cannot be tetrahedral if they are not tetrahedral they are not sterogenic centers so this includes all the ch2s and the ch3 groups and any sp or sp2 hybridized carbons example of a sterogenic center we can see given in the slide we have carbon bonded to bromine iodine fluorine and chlorine since it has four different groups that is called a sterogenic center the other example we can see is 3 bromohexane in 3 bromohexane the third carbon has an ethyl group a hydrogen a propyl group and a bromide so since there are four different groups it is also a sterogenic center note that two different alcohol groups an ethyl and a propyl are diff two different alcohol groups larger organic molecules can have two three or even hundreds of sterogenic centers figure 5.5 .5 represents two pairs of enantiomers one is leucine which is an amino acid you can see the pair of enantiomers and the other is bromohexane the pair of enantiomers draw from a different aspect sterogenic centers may also occur at carbon atoms that are part of a ring let us look at two examples to find the sterogenic center on ring carbons we always need to draw the rings as flat polygons and then we look for the tetrahedral carbons that are bonded to four different groups we look at methyl cyclopentane the carbon that that is where the methyl is attached is known as the carbon number one at carbon number one we have the methyl group and also the hydrogen but the other two groups attached in the ring are similar so the c1 here is not a sterogenic center and the next one that we're going to look at is 3-methylcyclohexane in 3-methylcyclohexane where the methyl is attached is the third carbon which is C3 since the first carbon 1 and 2 is where the double bond is located so we look at carbon number 3 of course it has a methyl group hydrogen but the two carbons that are attached in the ring are different because one carbon has a double bond and the other carbon is an sp3 carbon so there are four different groups attached to this c3 and it is a sterogenic center three methyl cyclohexane we have the methyl and the hydrogen substituents are above and below the plane of the ring and are drawn with dashes and wedges as usual so when we have a cyclohexane ring here we draw this is the double bond there and this methyl will be the wedge and the hydrogen is other dashes so we have a methyl and the hydrogen and the next the mirror image we, if we were to draw a mirror plane, we see this. This is the cyclohexane, right? This is the double bond here. So we have a methyl going up, and this is the hydrogen. So this is a pair of enantiomers. Many biologically active molecules contain sterogenic centers 
at green carbons as seen in the examples given in this slide. Let us see now how we can label serogenic centers with ROS. Enantiomers are two different compounds. They need to be distinguished by their names. This is done by adding the prefix ROS to the IUPAC name of the enantiomer. So naming enantiomers with the prefixes ROS is called the can ingol prelock system. We designate enantiomers as ROS according to their priorities. So priorities must be assigned to each group bonded to the sterogenic center in order of decreasing atomic number. The atom of the highest atomic number gets the highest priority. Let us look at the example given. The highest priority is bromide and the second priority is chloride. Fluorine is the third priority and hydrogen ha having the lowest atomic number has the lowest priority. So we have two atoms on a sterogenic center if they are the same, assign priority based on the atomic number of the atoms bonded to these atoms. One atom of higher atomic number determines the higher priority. Now we look that at the example given of 2-butanol, oxygen has the highest atomic number. So it has the number 1. Hydrogen has the lowest atomic number. So it has the number 4. So between the two carbons on the left and the right and on the right, both can be either 2 or 3. So now we look at rule number 2. So for rule number 2, we see the carbon on the left has 3 hydrogens, whereas the carbon on the right has two hydrogens and a carbon. So since the carbon on the left has only three hydrogens, it is a lower priority group as compared to the one on the right. The one on the right will have the number two, uh, second priority, and the one on the left would have the, would be the third priority. What if instead we have isotopes bonded to the sterogenic carbons? So if two isotopes are bonded to the sterogenic center, we assign priorities in order of decreasing mass number. Thus, in comparing the three isotopes of hydrogen, we have the first priority would be tritium since it has the mass number three consisting of one proton and two neutrons. And the second priority would be deuterium since it has a mass of two consisting of one proton and one neutron and hydrogen would have the last priority since it has only one proton. To assign a priority to an atom that is part of a multiple bond, we treat the multi multiply bonded atom as an equivalent number of singly bonded atoms. For example, the carbon of a carbonyl group, a CO group, is considered to be bonded to two oxygen atoms. We look at the uh, given example, the CO double bond is equivalent to the carbon being bonded to two oxygens. Other common multiple bonds drawn as below, we can see the given example when we see a carbon-carbon double bond, in actual fact, each carbon atom would be bonded to two carbon atoms. So each atom is in the double bond is drawn twice. And when there is a triple bond, each atom in the triple bond is drawn three times. In figure 5.6, we can see how to assign priorities to sterogenic centers. In the first, bromine is number one, chlorine is number two. The iodine is attached to a CH2, so it is not directly bonded to the sterogenic carbon, so it is number three. And number four is the hydrogen. In the next example, see number one, the first priority, this carbon is attached to two other carbons as compared to the carbon's priority for number two, three, and four. So since it has two carbons attached to it, it is considered the highest priority. 
and the second priority goes to the next longest chain it, it has two four five carbons and number three uh, the third priority has three carbons and the fourth priority has only one carbon in the last example you can see hydrogen the oxygen has the highest atomic number so it has the highest priority the next is the carbon that has the carboxyl group so this carbon actually has is considered to have three oxygen atoms bonded to it so it has the second priority the third priority goes to the CH2OH and of course hydrogen has the lowest priority okay let us see now how to assign RNS to a stereogenic center for look at A this is A we have the hydroxide up here the hydrogen is going to the back and we have the methyl coming forward and the ethyl on the same plane as the hydroxide so when we transfer it to the paper this is how it is so since hydrogen is already behind we assign this as number one priority because it has the highest priority the oxygen atom has the highest priority this one will have the second prior priority this is the third priority and this is number four priority and when we look at this this is going clockwise so this is an R and we were to look at the mirror image now this would be number one and this is number two and this is number three this is number four so now the priority is going anti-clockwise so this is an S Let us trace a circle priority from priority number 1 to number 2 and number 3. First of all, if we have number 1, number 2 and number 3, we trace it. It's going, this is clockwise, so it is R. And we, we have number 1 here and number 2 is here and number 3 is here. This is going anti-clockwise, so this is S. The letters R and S precedes the IUPAC name of the molecule. So for enantiomers of 2-butanol, as you can see just now, this is Let's stress now. This is number one, number two, number three. So this is two R, two butanol, and this is going anti-clockwise S two butanol. So let us look at now figure five point seven. We are going to orient the lowest priority group in the to the back. Now we can see. The lowest priority, hydrogen, is in front. This is number 4. This is number 1, number 2, and number 3. This is bromine, chlorine, and iodine. This is hydrogen. Now, we are going to orientate this to the back. So, we turn. When we turn this, you will see the hydrogen going to the back. And then, we have number 1 here, number 2 here, and number 3. So, this is going clockwise. This is an R isomer. The next one we can see, we have the lowest, the highest priority number one here, and this is the chlorine number two. This is your hydroxide, the oxygen, and the lowest priority is in the same plane as the hydroxide. So we can, what we can do now is turn again the molecule so that this is going to the back. When this goes to the back. Of course, this is number one, this is number two, and this is number three. This is going anti-clockwise. This is the S isomer. Okay, now, let us consider a diastereomer. A four molecule with N stereogenic centers, the maximum number of stereoisomers is two to, the, two to the power of N. Let us consider the stepwise procedure for finding all the possible stereoisomers of two, three, Dibromopentane.
First of all, we define and draw all the possible stereoisomers for this compound that has two stereogenic centers. These are the two stereogenic centers. So, in order to draw for the first uh, compound, we see this is the carbon, joined to the carbon. These are the front carbon. This is the front bond. This is the one that is pointing towards me. This is going away. And this one is going away. This is going up. And here, going up here, we have an ethyl. And back here, we have a hydrogen. In front here, we have a bromine. And up here, we have an methyl. Back here, we have a hydrogen. And front here, we have a bromine. This is the stero one stereoisomer of 2,3-dimethyl, uh, sorry, 2,3-dibromopentane. Then we draw its mirror image. So this is the mirror image of this molecule. So we can see now we have a carbon here. And up here is a methyl. And coming out here is the bromine. And going back here is the hydrogen. Join to this carbon atom. And then up here is the ethyl. Back here going back is the hydrogen. And coming up front here is the bromine. So these two compounds A and B are mirror images of each other. Say if you were to rotate this compound 180 degrees, so when we rotate this 180 degrees, and we will get, uh, we can draw again the compound, this one would be the ethyl here, and in front here would be the hydrogen, and back here will be the bromine. And front here we will have the methyl, right? And the bromine will be back here. And the front here we will have the hydrogen. And we can see these two are not superimposable on each other. Since this is A, it is not superimposable on B, they are different compounds. So in this case, A and B do not align, making A non, A and B superimposable, impossible, therefore they are enantiomers. These are two of the four possible stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromopentane. The switching positions of hydrogen and bromine or any two groups on one stereogenic center of either A or B forms a new stereoisomer we can see in this case labeled C and from A if we were to switch drawing again the same compound we have switching the bromine with the hydrogen now we have hydrogen in front and bromine going to the back and this will still be the same. We have bromine here and hydrogen back here. And we have the, this is the methyl. Now this is compound C. Compound A and compound C are not the same. So, but they are called diastereomers. And we can draw a mirror, mirror image of compound C so this compound is will be the mirror image of compound we have a bromine in front here with the hydrogen here and then we draw hydrogen here bromine here and this is your methyl okay this we label this as d so c and d are Enantiomers A and C, A, B and C are diastereomers. A and D, B and D are diastereomers. Let us now consider the stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromobutane. 
for this compound, you can see this molecule has two sterogenic centers. Since it has two sterogenic centers, okay, we have hydrogen and bromine, hydrogen, bromine, and methyl. These are the stereogenic centers. There should be a total of four stereoisomers. But to find all the stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromomethane, let us see. Let us look at one arrangement first, where we have the hydrogen, bromine, and the methyl groups attached to the stereogenic carbons. So we can see in this arrangement, we have the bromines and the hydrogens opposite direction to each other. Since they are in opposite directions to each other, there is no plane of symmetry. So, it can, from here, we can draw out the uh, three-dimensional structure of 2,3-dibromo butane like this this is bromine and this is hydrogen so there will be a mirror plane and from here we can see the bromine will be at the back here in front here is the hydrogen here is the bromine hydrogen and this is the there is there are actually a pair of enantiomers and these are two stereoisomers. Since just now we saw the two stereoisomers for 2,3-dibromobutane, let us find the other two stereoisomers if they exist. Let us switch the positions of the two groups on the one stereogenic center and we will end up with this isomer where we have both the bromines on the same side and the both hydro both hydrogens are on the same side. When after switching, we will find that there is a plane of symmetry. Drawing out the three-dimensional structure, we will see that this now here shows a plane of symmetry. This is a meso compound compound when we were if we were to draw its um, mirror image we will find that the mirror image would be superimposable on the uh, each other we turn this 180 degrees and they will would be able to superimpose on each other. So D and C and D are actually identical. This is a meso compound and it is an A chiral compound. Now we can see now compound C contains a plane of symmetry and it is A chiral. Meso compounds generally contain a plane of symmetry. So they possess two identical halves. So because one stereoisomer of 2,3-dibromobutane is superimposable on its mirror image, there are actually only three stereoisomers and not four. Okay, we can see now as in figure 5.9, the three stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromobutane. A and B are a pair of enantiomers. And A and C, B and C are diastereomers. C is a meso compound. So its mirror image is superimposable on itself. So it has no enantiomer. Now we're going to see how to assign R, R and S in compounds with two or more stereogenic centers. When a compound has more than one stereogenic center, R and S configurations must be assigned to each of them. As in given in the example, one stereoisomer of 2,3-dibromo 
maintain. You see at carbon number two, the highest priority is bromine. And the second priority is the carbon on the right that has the bromine. And the third priority is methyl. And hydrogen being the lowest priority is at the back. So it is going anti-clockwise. It will have the S configuration. The third carbon, which is also a stereogenic center, look at bromine is pointing to the front and the carbon number two, is on, which is on the left, has the bromine. So it is the second priority. Third priority is the methyl group. And hydrogen is at the back. Since the co configuration is going round clockwise, it has an R configuration. And the complete name for this compound is 2S3R23-dibromopentane. As a summary, we can now see identical, identical compounds have the same R and S designations at every tetrahedral stereogenic center, whereas enantiomers will have exactly opposite R and S designations, and diastereomers will have the same R and S designation for at least one stereogenic center and the opposite for, a, for at least another stereogenic center. Let us consider a di-substituted cycloalkane. We consider 1,3-dibromocycloventane. Since it has two stereogenic centers, it should have a maximum of four stereoisomers. The, the stereogenic centers in 1,3-dibromocycloventane are located at carbon number 1 and number 3. A di-substituted cycloalkane can have two substituents on the same side of the ring, which is the cis isomer, as we can see in A, and they can be on the opposite sides of the ring, as in the trans isomer in B. These compounds are stereoisomers, and they are not mirror images of each other. They are diastereomers. In order to find the other two stereoisomers, if they exist, we first need to draw the mirror images of each compound and determine whether the compound and its mirror image are superimposable. As we can see, A, 1,3-dibromocyclopentane, when both bromine are on the same side, when we draw the mirror image of this cis compound, the cis isomer is superimposable on its mirror image, making the images identical. Thus, A is an achiral meso compound. The trans isomer is not superimposable on its mirror image. So we can see the mirror image of the trans isomer labeled C, B and C are different compounds and they are enantiomers. Because one stereoisomer of 1,3-dibromocyclopentane is superimposable on its mirror image, there are actually only three stereoisomers, not four. Let us see now how we can draw Fisher projections. Fisher projections are actually flat drawings that represents a 3D molecule. A chiral carbon is at the intersection of horizontal and vertical lines. Horizontal lines are forward, out of the plane. As we can see, horizontal lines are forward and out of the plane. This is your hydroxide and this is the hydrogen. They are forward. These are the horizontal lines. And vertical lines are going behind the plane. This is the plane. Here's the plane. So this is coming forward and this is going behind. So since we see this uh, structure of lactic, as lactic acid, the perspective drawing of this molecule would be from here we can see in front here we have the hydrogen. Oh, at the back here is the methyl. Okay, the one on in the same plane we have the up here is the carboxyl group and over here is the hydroxide group. This is a 3D perspective formula. 
And if we were to turn this, now we turn this this way, we can draw this. This is come, this is going to the back, and this is coming in front. So coming in front here, we have the hydroxide and the hydrogen. Going to the back, we have the carboxyl group and the methyl group. And from here, we transfer this to 2D, two-dimensional on a flat paper. So this is going to the back on the vertical plane and coming forward on the horizontal plane as this. Mirror images from Fisher projections are easy to draw and it is easy to find enantiomers. It's also easy to find the inter internal mirror planes. For example, we look at this molecule. Okay, we have the methyl here. This is the hydrogen. This is the stereogenic centers. So, drawing this, we can draw the mirror image very easily. So, this is Cl here. Hydrogen is here. Over here is the methyl. Methyl. And here is the hydrogen and here is the chloride. So from here we can see this um, is not superimposable on this. But if we, were, if we were to switch any one of this and we can see that now we will have this compound. This compound we can easily see that is a mirror plane. And since it has a mirror plane, this is a meso compound. And this is a para enantiomers. Let us see now how we can determine the R and S configurations on a Fisher projection. The lowest priority is hydrogen. And it is coming forward. So, assign rules should be backwards. And you can see here, going clockwise, this is number one, this carbon, since it is attached to a chlorine. So this is number two, this is number one, number two, and this is number three. This going in a clockwise direction. But since hydrogen is coming forward, so the assignment should be in the opposite direction. This is an S. For this carbon, we can see here, this is number 1, this is number 2, and this is number 3. It is going again in a clockwise direction. And since hydrogen is on the horizontal axis and it is coming towards us, so the assignment again will have to be in the opposite direction. So this carbon is also an S. Okay, let us look at diasteromers. Diasteromers are stereoisomers which are not mirror images of each other. They can be geometric isomers which are cis and trans or they can be molecules with two or more chiral carbons. Alkenes can exist as cis and trans isomers. Cis trans isomers are not mirror images of each other, so they are diasteromers. In the example given, this is cis to butene and trans to butene. Ring compounds can also ex exist as cis trans isomers. An example is 1 to dimethyl cyclopentane, as we discussed earlier, the trans 1 to dimethylcyclopentane has a mirror image. So, its mirror image, the, a pair of mirror images of trans 1 to dimethylcyclopentane are enantiomers. But, the cis 1 to dimethylcyclopentane has a plane of symmetry. And it has, the, its mirror image is, also, is superimposable on it. Since its mirror image is superimposable, only one stereoisomer of cis 1 2 dimethyl cyclopentane exists. It is achiral. So the relationship between 
the uh, the trans one two dimethyl cyclopentane and cis one two dimethyl cyclopentane, they are diastereomers. What if a compound has two or more chiral carbons? They are they enantiomers or are they diastereomers or are they meso? First of all, we need to assign the R and S to each stereo, uh, to each stereogenic carbon. Enantiomers will have opposite configurations at each, uh, each corresponding chiral carbon, whereas diastereomers have some matching and some opposite configurations. Meso compounds will have an internal mirror plane and the number of stereoisomers that is possible for any given chiral compound is calculated with the number 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of chiral carbons. Let us look at an example. We take tartaric acid. 2R, 3R tartaric acid is the mirror image of 2S, 3S tartaric acid. So these are a pair of enantiomers. 2R, 3S tartaric acid has a mirror plane of symmetry. So it is a meso compound. Therefore, for tartaric acid, there are only three stereoisomers and not four. Okay, let us look now at the fischer rosenow convention. Before 1951, only relative configurations are known. Sugars and amino acids with same relative configuration as positive were assigned as D. And those that have the same as negative were assigned as L. So, with X-ray crystallography, we now know that absolute configurations D is are actually the R configuration, and R L is actually the S configuration. There is no relationship between the dextro and levorotary optical activity of the compound. Some examples of D and L assignments are seen here. One is D positive glyceraldehyde. We have L positive glutamic acid. D positive glucose. So we can summarize the properties of diastereomers. Actually, diastereomers have different physical properties. That is, they have different melting and boiling points. They can also be separated easily. Enantiomers differ only in reaction with other chiral molecules and the direction in which polarized light is rotated. And enantiomers are difficult to separate. A pair of enantiomers can actually be separated by reacting at first with a with a expressomic mixture and to form the diastereomer. As we can see in the example given here, we have S2-butanol and R2-butanol, which is reacted with RR, positive tartaric acid, and the resulting products, which is which are S2-butyl RR tartrate and R2-butyl RR tartrate. These are a pair of diastereomers, and these that two compounds are easily separated. After they are separated, we can acidify them, we can hydrolyze them, and then we will get back the R tartaric acid with the S2 butanol when we use S2 butyl and RR tartrate, and we can get back R2 butanol and RR positive tartaric acid when we hydrolyze R2 butyl. RR tartrate compound. In order to summarize the different types of isomers, let us look at figure 5.10. We start off with compounds that are different but with the same molecular formula. They can be divided into constitutional isomers and stereoisomers. Constitutional isomers would have the same molecular formula but different arrangements of atoms. Whereas stereo stereoisomers would have the same arrangement of atoms. Only certain atoms 
would be occupying different space. So, and if the images are uh, mir they are mirror images of each other and they are non superimposable, they are a pair of enantiomers. But if they are not mirror images of each other, they are called diastereomers. Let us see now how we can determine the relationship of two non identical molecules. First of all, we look at the molecular formula. Do they have the same molecular formula? If they do not have the same mole uh, molecular formula, therefore they are not isomers. But if they have the same molecular formula, they are isomers. So we go to the next step. Are the molecules named the same? That is, do they have the same name uh, except for the prefixes such as cis trans, R or S? If they do not have, so they must be constitutional isomers. But if they have, then they are stereoisomers. So since they are stereoisomers, let us compare them and see whether they are mirror images of each other. If they are mirror images of each other, yes, we call them enantiomers. But if they are not mirror images of each other, they are diastereomers. Okay, let us look now at the physical properties of stereoisomers. Stereoisomers would have optical activity. So the chemical and physical properties of two enantiomers must be identical except in their interaction with chiral substances. They have identical physical properties except for how they interact with the plane of polarized light. The plane of polarized light is the light that has an electric vector that oscillates in a single plane. Plane polarized light arises from passing ordinary light through a polarizer. A polarimeter is an instrument that allows polarized light to travel through a sample tube containing an organic compound. It permits the measurement of the degree to which an, elect an organic compound rotates this plane polarized light. The diagram shows that of a polarimeter. You can see we have ordinary light, we have a polarizer and a sample tube. And if the sample if the compound in the sample tube is achiral, you will find that the light that exits the sample tube remains unchanged. So the achiral compound would be optically inactive. With chiral compounds, the plane of polarized light is rotated through an angle, alpha. The angle alpha is measured in degrees and is called the observed rotation. A compound that rotates polarized light is said to be optically active. The polarimeter, in the polarimeter, if we have, in the sample tube, we see a chiral compound, we can see the light that is passed through the plane the polarizer, we will find that the light that exits will be deflected at an angle alpha. So this compound would be a chiral compound. The rotation of polarized light can be either clockwise or anticlockwise. If the rotation is clockwise, the compound is said is dex is called dextrorotatory. The rotation is labeled D or plus. If the rotation is counterclockwise, the compound is called levorotatory. The rotation is labeled L or minus. Two enantiomers rotate plane of polarized light to an equal extent but in opposite directions. Thus, if enantiomer A rotates polarized light positive 5 degrees, the same concentration of enantiomer B will rotate the plane of polarized light minus 5 degrees. No relationship exists between R and S prefixes. 
and the plus and the minus designations can only indicate optical rotation. An equal amount of two enantiomers we call a racemic mixture or a racemic. A racemic mixture is optically inactive. This is because two enantiomers will rotate the plane of polarized light to an equal extent but in, in opposite directions. So the rotations will cancel each other and no rotation is observed. Table 5.1 shows the physical properties of enantiomers A and B. First, let us look at melting point. A alone will be identical to B. Same as in B alone will be identical to A. But a racemic mixture of A and B may be different. A and B may be different. Okay, the boiling point for A and B, they, are, they would be identical when they are alone. But, again, in a racemic mixture, they may be different. A may be different from B. For optical rotation, when A alone would be equal in magnitude but opposite in sign to B. And vice versa. But, for a racemic mixture, the optical rotation would be zero. Because, the rotation of A will cancel B. And vice versa. The specific rotation is a standardized physical constant for the amount that a chiral compound rotates plane polarized light. Specific rotation is denoted by the symbol alpha and defined using a specific sample tube with a length L in decimeter, concentration C in grams per milliliter, temperature at 25 degrees Celsius, and wavelength of 589 nanometers. So specific rotation is equals to observed rotation alpha divided by the length of the tube times the concentration. Enantiomeric excess or optical purity is a measurement of how much and one enantiomer is present in excess of the racemic mixture. It is denoted by the symbol EE. E. EE e is equals to percentage of one enantiomer minus the percentage of the other enantiomer. So let us consider an example. If a mixture contains 75% of one enantiomer and 25% of the other enantiomer, so the enantiomeric excess would be 75 minus 25%, we will get 50%. Thus, there is a 50% excess of one enantiomer over the racemic mixture. The enantiomeric excess can also be calculated if the specific rotation of a mixture and the specific rotation of a pure enantiomer are known. And EE is given by the alpha, the specific rotation of the mixture, divided by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer times 100. Since enantiomers have identical physical properties, they cannot be separated by common physical techniques like distillation. Diastereomers and constitutional isomers have different physical properties. Therefore, they can be separated by common physical techniques. Okay, figure 5.12 shows the physical properties of three stereoisomers of tartaric acid. A and B are enantiomers. And C is the diastereoma of A and B. Uh, and B. Okay, the physical properties of A and B differ from their diastereoma C. The physical properties of a racemic mixture of A and B can also differ from either enantiomer and uh, can diastereoma C. C is an achiral meso compound, so it is optically inactive. So its specific rotation is zero. Two enantiomers have exactly the same chemical properties except for their reaction with chiral non racemic reagents. Many drugs are chiral and often must react with a chiral receptor or chiral enzyme to be effective. One enantiomer of a drug may be effectively may effectively treat a disease, whereas its mirror image may be ineffective or toxic. 
Let us look at nepro, neprozen. As neprozen is actually an anti-inflammatory agent, whereas R neprozen is a liver toxin. Research suggests that the odor of a particular molecule is determined more by its shape than by the presence of a particular functional group. So because enantiomers interact with chiral smell receptors, some enantiomers have different odors. And an example of this is caraway car seeds, which is S carbon, has the odor of caraway, and R carbon has the odor of spearmint, which are spearmint leaves. Cyclooctane and other molecules similar in shape bind to a particular olfactory receptor on the nerve, on the nerve cells that lie at the top of the nasal passage. Binding results in a nerve impulse that travels to the brain, which interprets impulses from particular receptors as specific odors. So that concludes our topic on stereochemistry. Thank you.